The head, neck, and shoulders are intricately connected by several different muscles. The most superficial muscles being the upper trap, middle trap, and levator scapula. The brain communicates with these muscles through the 11th cranial nerve and the nerves at C3 and C4. These muscles contract the shoulder towards the neck, which causes pressure on the upper part of the vertebrae, creating tension and pain. The muscles that are much deeper are the transversal spinalis and splenius capitis. The nerves that innervate these muscles are found from the C1 through the C6. These muscles connect the head and neck, which means looking down, like reading, computer work, or especially phone or tablet work, can cause problems. Start in a side-lying position with a foam roller between the neck and shoulder. Use your top leg to press into the floor rolling your body up, which will create pressure downward through that shoulder. You're trying to create as much movement between the ear and shoulder as possible while relaxing the head toward the floor. You may increase the intensity of work by rolling the foam roller up and down using your hand. To work different points of the neck, simply roll backwards, keeping the chin and chest directly in line while opening the shoulders to the ceiling. An additional way to create greater intensity is by creating a saw-like motion, pulling the end of the foam roller toward your neck and then relaxing. You need to allow yourself to relax during the saw-like motion to break down the muscle tissue in the upper trap and neck. Continue to change the position working the areas that are most tender. If you are tensing your body, it is not helping. My recommendation is to continue this work anywhere from two to three minutes on each side before moving on. A common headache that comes through my door is when someone comes in and paints across the forehead the pain that they feel. Commonly, it's also associated to have eye pain with this sort of headache. The muscles typically causing this headache are actually on the back side of the head and they are called the occipital muscles. When the occipitals get extremely tight, they pull on the back of the head over the top of the head, creating the tension and pressure you feel in the forehead. So let's take a look at how to release these muscles to get rid of your headache. Using two lacrosse balls directly on the back of the head and lying on the ground, use a book to elevate the lacrosse balls. You're going to press down into the lacrosse balls and move them around the back of your head until you find the part that is most tender. At this point, you're going to begin pressing your head down into the lacrosse ball as hard as you can tolerate. This pressure should recreate the headache that you commonly feel across your forehead. Continue this pressure for 30 seconds. I will continue to talk you through the 30 seconds here. Do not let up on your pressure. Continue to push as hard as you possibly can in the occipital muscles in the back of your head. Try even increasing the tension and feel the headache. You know you're doing it correctly if you continue to feel the headache the whole time you're on these muscles. And we finish in three, two, one. Wonderful, now we're done with the occipital release. Next, we're going to be working on the atlanoaxial junction and the rest of the cervicals. The first muscles for us to focus on are at the atlantoaxial junction, and they are called the obliquus capitis major, obliquus capitis superior and inferior, and the rectus capitis posterior minor. Once we have worked through those, we will work on the rotatories and the semispinalis services. Laying on your back with a book under your head and neck, place the lacrosse balls directly in line with the junction of the head and neck. Once you have the lacrosse balls in that position, tilt the head up and down like you're nodding your head yes. This should cause a contraction of the muscle tissue on top of the lacrosse ball and then a stretch as you look down. Once you've completed the work on that junction, move down a half an inch to the next cervical and continue this process until you have worked your way down the entire neck. Be sure to get a tight contraction tucking the chin, followed by a strong contraction tilting the head back in order for this technique to work. If you get to a point where it feels like one side is worse than the other, you may rotate your head to that side and continue to nod yes. For example, if I had some extra tension on the left side of my neck, I would rotate my head to the left and continue to contract up and down. Remember to do this continuously through the entire neck, rotating to the left or right as needed. 
Our final release is going to be on the upper and middle trap and levator scapula. These muscles contract the shoulder to the head. This release requires a massage stick and a clear wall. We want to start by locating the trap and levator, which holds the shoulder up to the ear. Once located, lean against the wall, allowing the stick to press down into the shoulder. Once you've created that pressure, you can start turning your head down and away from that trap. You'll notice I continue to hold the massage stick with my right hand and let the massage stick push my left shoulder down. Carpal tunnel syndrome commonly is caused by forearm muscles that get overly tight and create compression on your carpals. We will start by working through the extensor digitorum, the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and extensor carpi ulnaris. Start with a lacrosse ball on the upper part of the forearm. You'll notice when you make a fist and squeeze the knuckles up, the muscles will tighten in the upper part of the forearm near the elbow. Press down with the lacrosse ball and flex the wrist. Release the pressure on the lacrosse ball, returning the wrist to extension or knuckles up. Repeat this process multiple times over the top side of the forearm in the extensors of the wrist. Do this at a brisk pace. An additional way to work this muscle tissue is by using your own forearm. Locate the flexors of the wrist by squeezing the knuckles up. Lay your arm across your knees and press your elbow into the tissue. Repeat, knuckles up, pressure on, knuckles down, pressure off. Continue this process through the muscle on the top of the forearm. The next group of muscle tissue that creates more pressure on the carpals as well is on the inside of the forearm. These are called the flexor carpi radialis and ulnaris and palmaris longus. Using a technique like the extensors, start with an open palm flexing your fingers towards the elbow as far as you can. After you put pressure down on the muscle tissue, using your opposite elbow, open your hand pointing your fingers to the floor as far as you possibly can. Lift the pressure, flex the wrist, bringing the fingers to the starting position. Continue this process for roughly 30 seconds in multiple spots working briskly. The next area to focus on is the retinaculum. This is a ligamentous band around the wrist that keeps the tendons close to the bone. Oftentimes, the tendons underneath the retinaculum get adhered and make it very painful within the carpals themselves. Focusing on the retinaculum, glide the thumb up and down the entire band spanning from the mid wrist all the way into the base of the hand. Work vigorously with firm pressure for 30 seconds in order to break adhesions that lie deep within the carpals. Now it's time to perform a joint mobilization. You can see there are several bones that make up the carpal area of the wrist. We want to simply restore some range of motion to the carpals. Using your opposite hand, create a tight squeeze around the wrist and drag the hand away from the elbow as you hold the wrist. Begin to rotate the wrist in a big circle. Continue mobilizing the wrist for 30 seconds. Now we're going to create a stretch that's going to help the nerves communicate with the wrist. Sitting in a chair, press the shoulder down towards the floor. Rotate the thumb and wrist backwards, then flex the wrist and fingers up to the ceiling. Create a neural glide by looking down and away from that arm. Continue to perform this stretch 30 to 60 seconds. To begin working the muscles that are most affected by de Quervain's, hold your hand with your thumb straight up in the air, then locate the tendon that is most superficial or on top of the wrist. This tendon will be controlled by a muscle that runs up the arm towards the elbow. I want you to contract the muscle tissue by flexing your wrist up and down while you press into the muscle tissue with your thumb. If this is too difficult to use your thumb, 
grab a lacrosse ball and place pressure directly onto the forearm using the palm of your hand. Remember to create this contraction seven to 10 times, pressing straight into the muscle tissue near the elbow. Next, we are going to run pressure from the wrist up the forearm towards the elbow, creating a firm pressure, driving up and stretching the tissue. Again, we can use the lacrosse ball and just roll up the arm, creating a release of that tissue. The bicep is named that because there are two different attachment points near the shoulder. The short head attaches to the coracoid process, which is a part of the shoulder blade, and the long head goes over the humerus through the biceps channel and connects in the socket. Pain will be present inside your arm if there's a problem with the short head. If there's a problem with the long head, typically the pain will run over the shoulder. We're going to locate the head of the biceps that attaches near the forearm. To do this, flex your arm with your fingers on the bicep near the elbow and find the tendon at the base of the muscle belly. Simply pinch the muscle belly and extend the arm. If you feel like you're not getting enough pressure with your fingertips, use a lacrosse ball. Try one of two positions, either holding with your fingers or pressed with the palm into the bicep. I find I get better pressure when I use my palm Remember to squeeze and extend. Another muscle that could create bicep pain is actually in your forearm. This is the brachioradialis, which passes from the humerus towards the wrist. To begin working the brachioradialis, reach under the elbow across to the forearm and pinch down as hard as you can tolerate. Now rotate the wrist and the muscle should feel like it grinds underneath the fingertips. Do seven to 10 repetitions, then locate a new point and continue to grind over that muscle. You should feel the fingers drop off the muscle. When you finish, put the fingers on top of the arm, pinch down and create extension while rotating the wrist. Again, bend the elbow, then extend while you rotate the wrist. Notice my hand goes palm to chest then palm to floor while I'm extending my elbow. Perform seven to 10 repetitions and then move on to the next tender spot and repeat. When you have finished the pin and stretch, move on to cross fiber friction. Place the arm you are working across your knees, then grind the opposite forearm across the muscle tissue near the bicep head. This should be an abrasive force moving through the muscle tissue quickly Continue to press through that muscle tissue until you feel like you've broken down the entire thing. Here. For pelvic tilt. Remember, as we do pelvic tilts, right, we want to create a Kegel. That's like you're cutting off going to the bathroom. And then think of Doritos under your low back and crush that Dorito. Three, two, one, pelvic tilt. Okay, so pelvic tilt again, Kegel. Get that pelvic floor really firm, tighten down, and then compress that core, crushing that Dorito under the low back. Another great way to think about this is if you had a belt under your low back, right? Pin that belt to the floor so I couldn't come up and pull that belt out, okay? Or think something's about to whack you in the stomach. That's halfway. Okay, tight, tight squeeze, tight core. We're trying to crank through these with as much pressure as we possibly can, focused on the core. Now, we call it a pelvic tilt because it should roll the pelvis uh, kind of so your tailbone's lifting off the floor. Do not make that happen by pushing your feet in the ground, right? We want light feet. Make it just come from the core, pinning the belt to the Three, floor. Three, <laughs> two, one, 
Prepare for pelvic tilt with me, Paul Arsh. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with knee fall out. Good core compression, super, super tight. Do your absolute best all the way through to create that contraction. That's halfway. Remember, your feet should be together here. As your knee goes out to the side, squeeze your core harder. Okay, so it's as you're moving, recompress the core, recompress the core, recompress the core, then bring the knee back up. Do not let your pelvis tilt back and forth on the floor, right? We want to set the pelvis and think that's a bowl of water. Right? Don't let that bowl tilt left and right. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with adduction. All right, tilt with adduction. Grab that foam roller. Squeeze your core tight, then squeeze the knees. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with adduction. Very distinct movement. Kegel, core compression. Squeeze those knees. Release the knees, keep the core tight, then release the core. Okay, very, very distinct. You should be in control of your core, whether you contract or relax through those hips in any direction. That's halfway. Halfway, re-squeeze the core, okay? Perfect time to just go, okay, I can squeeze even harder, okay? It's not about the movement of the knees, right? I don't care how tight the squeeze is on the knees, I care about how tight the core stays. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with knee toward chest. Okay, tilt with knee toward chest. That just means a march, okay? And simply one leg at a time up towards the chest. Set the foot back down. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with knee toward chest. Okay, good. Tight squeeze through the core. Shoulders down and back. Keep that core compression going whole time you march. So even as the foot's returning to the floor. Ready for you. Okay, again, this is trying to create kind of what I call the Rubik's Cube. That's halfway. To where when you lift your knee, it's trying to pull your hip, that one side up in the air. Okay, don't let your pelvis transition at all. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with bridge. Solid spine. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with bridge. Straight lift. Pinch those butt cheeks together tight. That's Good halfway. squeeze, halfway through. So recompress that core. We want to check as you return to the ground, your hips, low back, and ribs should all touch at the same time. I want your core to maintain that tight squeeze as you're moving. So both up and down. A lot of times what happens is when we go to lift, we start arching the back to complete that lift. Okay, so tuck your tail under. Three, two, one. 
Prepare for shoulder drops. Shoulders down and back, out of the ears and to the floor, okay? Or think, get your uh, shoulders Three, down to your butt. Two, one, shoulder drop. Okay, then as your arm goes up overhead, that's a relaxation. Pull your shoulder back down to return your arm up. Okay, this isn't just a movement in the shoulder joint, this is actually the whole shoulder blade. Let the shoulder blade go as your arm goes overhead. And again, pull your shoulder down and back. You should feel this through your ribs, okay, on that back side. Pull those shoulders down, back, down, back. That's halfway. Halfway is a great time to recheck that core, make sure we're not extending our back to try to create more range of motion. Finish through nice and strong, recompress that core, shoulders down and back. Three, two, one, prepare for dead bug. Remember, tight squeeze through the core first. Three, two, one, dead bug. Okay, remember that dead bug, it's like having a box in between the arms and the legs, and you're holding that core tight. Only extend the leg as far towards the floor as your core can stay tight. If you extend that leg and you're trying to reach for the floor and your low back pops up, you're extending too far, okay? Rather than think that the gains come from getting your leg to the floor, think the That's gains halfway. come from connecting your brain to that muscle tissue really hard. Okay, so right now, if you think you're squeezing hard enough, you're wrong, squeeze harder. Squeeze harder, harder. All the way through, hold, compress that spine. Keep it down and back, down and back. Three, two, one, long rest. A great work on that. So we do want to take some time right now, right, rest, get a little bit of a drink, and then we're gonna jump right into round two. Now for round two, we're gonna make it a little more difficult by way of trying to lift your feet just a tiny bit. So imagine your feet are on a scale. You're gonna lift just 50% of the weight off your feet, okay? Then create whatever movement that we're gonna create, okay? So always pelvic tilt first, so Kegel, core compression. Hover, you know, a little bit of pressure off the feet, then create our movements. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt. Three, two, one, pelvic tilt. Good, solid squeeze through your Kegel and core compression. Gently lift 50% of the weight off your feet, right? So you shouldn't even move, right? There should be no movement added in. It's just a tiny bit of a lift. And if you feel that low back kind of start peeling up off the ground, squeeze your core harder. That's halfway. Again, squeeze that core. As you lift those feet a tiny, tiny bit, make sure you squeeze even harder to keep your core down. So right here I show you what happens if we're not tighten the core. That pelvis is just gonna roll right up. So re-squeeze that core, tight compression. Squeeze hard and then get a little bit of a lift. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with knee fallout. Okay, pelvic tilt with knee fallout. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with knee fallout. Again, as your knee's going out to the side, you should be really light on your feet. 
keeping that core compressed and there should be no tilting or movement rolling in the pelvis at all. Okay, core compressed, hard, hard, hard. Drive that spine down into the floor. Create that pelvic tilt, keeping your Kegel tight. And yes, this is a very demanding exercise. It should not be easy. This That's is easy. Way. You need to go connect your core, uh, connect your brain back down to that core. Get it tight. Squeeze firm all the way through. Remember to keep some of the pressure off the feet. Be out to the side, back up. Do not let your pelvis shift or move. Let's get all the way through here, all the way through. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with adduction. Okay, tilt with adduction, grab that foam roller, six step movement, core tight, squeeze the knees, lift, set, release the knees, release the core. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with adduction. Press that core super hard. Make sure you still have that Kegel tight. Squeeze the knees, lift the pressure off your feet, set your feet back down, release the knees. Kegel and core should still be there. Then release your core. Okay, redo that. Real firm compression, super distinct in the way that you're moving. Create solid compressions, right? Each one, very firm, very firm. That's you should be thinking way. with every movement, it's as hard as you can possibly squeeze. Okay, so squeeze that Kegel, core compression, as hard as you possibly can. Squeeze your feet, or squeeze your knees together as hard as you possibly can, right? Very distinctly, pressure off the feet, set the feet back down, release the knees, Kegel and core should still be there, then release the core. Finish all the way through, nice and strong. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with knee toward chest. Okay, back to the march. So again, feet should be light. Do not let the pelvis shift. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with knee toward chest. Good core compression, Kegel, core compressed. You need to maintain that through the movement of the hips. Everything tight. Okay, so either the Dorito or the belt under the low back, make sure you're pinning that to the ground. Right? Doritos, we're trying to crush the cornmeal okay, all the way down. That's halfway. Good, tight squeeze all the way through. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with bridge. Tilt and bridge. Remember, every time you come back down to the ground, I want you to compress that core so hard it lays flat. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with bridge. A good compression, squeeze hard. Right? When you return to the ground, your hips, low back, and ribs should all touch at the same time. That shows that we didn't arch the back through the movement. That's halfway. Perfect time to re-squeeze that core, compress hard. Right? Squeeze your butt cheeks together like you're pinching a penny. That's where the lift should be coming from. Right? The lift isn't coming from shoving your shoulders into the ground. The lift is coming from extending those hips using your butt cheeks. Three, two, one. Prepare for shoulder drops. Set the shoulders down and back first. Even if you need to leave your arms by your sides, then put them up in the air. Three, two, one. Shoulder drop. Good shoulder drops and return keeping the shoulders out of the ears. 
Okay, so you might have to recheck that every single time that you perform the movement just to get the shoulders down and back out of the ears as much as you possibly can. Okay, firm compression. Still driving that low back into the floor. Kegel core compression. Hold it really, really tight. That's halfway. Again, perfect time to recheck it. Make sure those feet are light. 50% of the weight off those feet. Shoulders down and back. Create a big demand. Make it difficult. As difficult as I'm asking you to. <laughs> tight squeeze, tight squeeze. Three, two, one. Prepare for dead bug. All right, dead bugs or bird dogs. So I'll show you the bird dogs here. Make sure you keep that core compressed. Three, two, one. Dead bug. We do not want to cat or cow through the bird dog. We want to make sure that we're holding compression through that core as you create the extension through your arms and legs. So the same thing as when you're doing a dirt, uh, dead bug. Right? You want to make sure that the back is staying in neutral. So don't overextend your legs or arms. Right? Just extend where you can, maintaining compression and... That's halfway. Keeping that core nice and tight. Right, all the way through, do your best to finish strong. Recompress that core. Pull those shoulders down and back. Same position as you were in. Squeeze tight. Seven seconds to finish. Three, two, one. Long rest. Okay, good, good work. So that is round two. So for round three, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on actually hovering the feet off of the ground. Okay, so every single movement, core is on first, off last, making sure you've got that Kegel compression, see if you can hover the feet. Now, that's a goal. So if you can't do that, that's okay. Just do one of the earlier rounds, right? So you might only be able to lift 50% of the weight off your feet right now. That's okay. We're just trying to create a larger demand as we go, figure out where that demand is too much Three, for you, and challenge two, it. One. Prepare for pelvic tilt. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt. Good tight pelvic tilts. Make sure that your core stays compressed as you try to hover those feet. And two, one thing that I see a lot is going up on the toes. Try not to go up on the toes. See if you can peel the whole foot flat off the ground and maintain that spinal compression. It's going to be a very, very big challenge. Now, if you notice you go to peel those feet and they just don't want to leave the floor and your back pops up, make sure to re-squeeze the core, okay? Harder, harder. Then just try again. It is absolutely okay in your exercises to make sure that you're re-squeezing each time. If you don't want Three, to do that, two, and you want to try to one, hold it the whole time. Prepare for pelvic tilt with knee fallout. That is perfectly fine as well. Okay, so don't get confused on whether we're re-squeezing and releasing every time. I like that just for the sole fact of your brain is Three, having to reconnect. Two, one, pelvic tilt with knee fallout. Okay, so if you can't reconnect, if you can't figure out uh, how to hold it and maintain tightness. Then you're going to want to re-squeeze each time. Okay, but no matter what, you want to be re-squeezing the core after every single movement. So whether you fully relax and re-squeeze. That's halfway. Or you just re-squeeze. No matter what, core compressed, tight, 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 trying to hover those feet, forcing the work really firm. Great. 
We're almost there. Work hard through it. Everything that you've got. Squeeze through. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with adduction. Remember to add the foam roller or a cushion here, and it's a six step process. Core tight, knees squeeze, lift the feet, set the feet, release the knees, Three, release. Two, one. Pelvic tilt with adduction. Okay, Kegel, core compression, super tight. Squeeze those knees, hover the feet, one, two, set the feet down, release the knees, keep the core tight, then release the core. Re squeeze, core tight. Squeeze those knees, lift the feet. Set the feet back down, release the knees, release the core. Okay. Very distinct. Keep squeezing all the way through. That's halfway. Halfway is always a great time to continue to recheck. Okay. Make sure that core is bearing down. Crush that Dorito. Pin a belt under your low back so it can't be pulled out. Keep working all the way through, all the way through. Try not to quit. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with knee toward chest. Good, tight pelvic tilt as you march. Remember, do not scissor kick. One leg at a time. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with knee toward chest. Good core compression, tight, tight, tight. Make sure the feet are hovering, but only move one at a time. That's halfway. Good core compression, squeeze tight, firm, 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 firm. Again, do not move both legs at the same time. You should hover your feet, move one knee up, back down to a hover, then the other knee up, back down to a hover. Reset if you need to, and then go again. All the way through, finish strong, seven seconds. Three, two, one. Prepare for pelvic tilt with bridge. Awesome, awesome work. Now into the bridge. Remember, when you return to the ground, your low back should not be arched. That's what you're watching for. Three, two, one. Pelvic tilt with bridge. Good, tight core compression. We're thinking lift through the butt cheeks, right? We're not shoving the shoulders down. We're actually lifting and extending the hips. Okay, when we return to the ground, low back, ribs, and hips should all touch at the same time. Make sure you follow through with that. That's halfway. Perfect time to recompress. Make sure you're maintaining that spinal compression. This is where we see the biggest change in the way we sit and stand. Can you maintain spinal compression through hip extension? Three, two, one. Prepare for shoulder drops. Get set for those shoulder drops. So start by pulling those shoulder blades down and back, then set your arms towards the ceiling. Three, two, one. Shoulder drop. Firm core compression, make sure that stays in place. Do not arch your back thinking it's helping to get more range of motion. You will get whatever range of motion is there, then pause at the end of that range of motion, pull the shoulder blades back, down and back. We train it this way because the more stability that we add to the shoulder blade, the more range of motion we're actually going to get out of the shoulder joint. That's halfway. Recompress that core, tight squeeze, firm, 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 all the way through.
3, 2, 1. Prepare for dead bug. Awesome. Last one of the day. Maintain that spinal compression as hard as you possibly can. Challenge yourself all the way through. 3, 2, 1. Dead bug. Tight squeeze, firm compression. Remember, you can be doing those bird dogs as well. Either one is fine, but make sure you maintain that compression, right? The stronger your core, especially in the bird dog, the more balanced you're going to be. And that's what we want to work on is how do we stimulate that core to tolerate extension movements just like what we're doing. Because every step that's you take halfway. is going to be right arm with left leg, then it's gonna be left arm with right leg, right? That's the way our body works, cross rotational patterns, one side to the other, firm compression all the way through. Okay, we've got 10 seconds left. Do your absolute best to finish strong through it. Three, two, one, long rest. <laughs> 